Good evening, good evening, liebes Publikum, dear audience. My name is Tuesday Bambri, and I'm going to be moderating this session tonight with our guest Anuk Arut Pragasam and Marie Löbner, who is going to be reading for us later. Pardon, Löbke. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, this is going to be a sort of bilingual event. Um, we decided to speak English and we hope you can follow. And if you have any questions, you're very welcome to ask. If you want to ask questions later, you're very welcome to ask them in German and we'll find a way. So let me introduce our guest. Anna was born in 1988 in Colombo, Sri Lanka. He's a Tamil language, well, a Tamil Sri Lankan who writes in English, mostly, but not only, and he's a translator. Um, we'll speak about that later, um, the, the way he translates into Tamil, into English, out of Tamil, out of English, and the, the reasons behind that. Um, he's got a PhD in philosophy from Columbia University, 2019, and he currently lives in Berlin. Uh, he's a fellow at the DAAD Literature Program. Uh, Anouk's debut novel, The Story of a Brief Marriage, appeared in 2016. It's set in 2009, during the final stages of the Sri Lankan Civil War. It won the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature, and the German translation, Die Geschichte einer kurzen Ehe, translated by Hannes Meyer, um, was shortlisted for the German Internationaler Literaturpreis. His second novel, novel, A Passage North, which is the book that we are going to discuss today, appeared in 2021. It was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and the German translation, Nach Norden, translated again by Hannes Meyer, appeared this year with Hansa. Um, Anuk, would you like to begin by telling us what is your novel about? Um, thank you for the introduction, Tuesday, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, you know, I haven't, asked, I haven't been asked that question in a while, so I, I have to think about it. It's uh, a novel set um, in 2014, 2015, in uh, the country that I'm from, Sri Lanka. Um, it takes place over a couple of days and begins with the death of a woman who lives in Sri Lanka with the main character, Krishan, and his grandmother, but who is from the northeast of Sri Lanka, from the war zone, um, and who suffered greatly during the violence of the last two years of the war. She lost both of her sons. Uh, she was kind of uh, a, a very irredeemably uh, tortured woman, it seems, um, tortured by her memories, uh, by flashbacks, by nightmares. Um, uh, and this character, Rani, comes to the south of the country uh, really to get away from where she lives, from her village and from the site of all of this violence. Uh, she goes to Sri Lanka to work as a caretaker for Krishan's uh, grandmother. And after a while she leaves, after some years of working with them, she leaves without giving notice to them. and. The book really begins uh, when Krishan, at home with his grandmother, receives a call from Rani's daughter informing him that she has died, that she's fallen into a well. And Krishan's immediate thought is that she uh, has perhaps committed suicide because she's given signs of, uh, of kind of self-destructive behavior before. And the novel is really just Krishan making his way to the north of the country, to the former war zone by train. Uh, it follows him through his thoughts as he looks out uh, of the window at the passing landscapes, uh, as he thinks about uh, his relationships to different people, his grandmother, to Rani, uh, to a woman he was in a relationship with uh, at another time in his life. Uh, and, it really, and, and it ends at the, at the funeral of, of Rani in a, in a small, kind of very out of the way 
rural area in the northeast of Sri Lanka. So the book is really just a kind of set of reflections and meditations and observations uh, as Kushan makes his way north. Mm, thank you. Um, I read an interview with you at, in the Paris Review um, magazine. The interviewer asked you, what are some aspects of novel writing that you don't pay as much attention to? And you answered story, creating well-rounded character, setting, dialogue, historical context, which basically for me is like for all of us, I guess, or for many of us, um, <laughs> everything that um, characterizes fiction writing. Um, and indeed, your novel is quite unique. I haven't read a novel like this in a long, long time, probably since college days when I was reading Virginia Woolf and Marcel Proust. Actually, your novel does not contain any dialogue. Um, and it's a stream of consciousness type of writing. Everything is seen through Krishan's eyes. It's really fascinating um, the way you manage to do this and still make it really contemporary. Um, maybe, would you like to, te to tell us why you don't use dialogue? Yeah, I mean, I, when, I, when I mentioned those things in the interview, I was being a little bit um, mischievous, probably. Um, there is a narrative in this book, obviously, even if there's no uh, gripping story. Um, and even if finding out how the narrative concludes is not really the point of reading the text, but it's true that I guess these are not the things, um, or these have not been the things for a long time that uh, that interested me or moved me so much when I um, when I wrote. And I think that that's probably because I came to writing uh, fiction from philosophy, and it has to do with I guess uh, the specific way that literature appealed to me as a person interested in in philosophical questions. Um, I felt that when I was, I was studying philosophy in the United States, uh, where philosophy is done in a very kind of technical and um, also sometimes mechanical manner in which uh, writers write, uh, uh, make very modest and precise claims, uh, but don't really uh, touch the living and moving and breathing parts of life. Um, uh, and it's also a context in which the questions, the philosophical questions people ask are questions that they ask removed from the context in which such questions organically arise. What I mean by that is philosophical questions generally arise to us uh, in moments of mystery or in moments of... Um, there's often certain kinds of confusion, certain kinds of tension, sometimes a sense of mystery, a sense of wonder that leads, especially young people, especially children, to ask philosophical questions. And a lot of uh, contemporary philosophers in the university, they tend to ask these questions as if there was no context for these questions to arise. And so I guess I found philosophy, uh, I found literature attractive because it allowed me to describe the texture of life uh, in a kind of concrete and extended way. And mm -hmm. it allowed me to raise questions or think about questions that I was interested in uh, from within the context of, uh, of ordinary life as arising from the texture and moods of, of, of everyday life. Um, and so what I sought, I think, when I started writing was, in, was the ability to describe textures and moods more than anything else. Textures, moods... Uh, the body and the, the the different positions the body finds itself in, and the way one's relationship to one's body, to one's moods, to one's environment uh, shape shape one's consciousness, mm -hmm. shape one's shape one's thoughts. And so, when I started writing, I wasn't really interested in um, yeah charting the trajectory of a of a character um, or or giving an account of the history or uh, nature of a society or a group of, or, or, or an individual. Um, I mean, that's changed the more I've, I guess, writing, I've, I've been writing, the more I've r r uh, read books with, uh, like books that emphasize character and plot and, mm -hmm. and to the extent that I've, you know, begun enjoying those kinds of, mm -hmm. those kinds of texts. But with 
respect to your question about dialogue, um, kind of a technical reason, most of the characters in my book are Tamil speakers, um, monolingual Tamil speakers in the north of Sri Lanka. And I mean, this is kind of a problem of translation, I would say. There's a technical problem whenever you translate um, from one language to another um, with how to convey dialect. People in the northeast of Sri Lanka have a very specific dialect, and a lot of Tamil literature, modern Tamil literature, will focus on, I guess a lot of the technical achievement of modern Tamil literature is the transcription of different kinds of dialect and the history and cultures that those dialects embody onto the page. Mm -hmm. And so as somebody who reads Tamil writing, uh, I would be faced in my own book with the, with the task of translating like dialectual Tamil, dialectical Tamil into, into English, which is very hard to do because the standard models for dialect in English, whether it be, I don't know, Southern American English or different parts of English from different parts of the UK, um, uh, all have very specific associations. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible to kind of uh, write a dialect in English without giving totally the wrong impression that Rani is actually, you know, an African American character from Chicago, or you know, a poor a poor lady from Liverpool or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so so I thought it was a little bit more honest if I if I make it clear that this 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 dialogue is being related relayed by the by the author. If I was mm -hmm. telling you what they were saying mm -hmm. rather than them speaking for themselves. And to be honest, I only realized that there was no dialogue when I read about your book after finishing it. Mm. The characters did speak in my head. Yeah, well, you know, it's actually... I didn't know that there was no dialogue either, <laughs> and then I just... Actually, the way it happened was I mentioned in an interview, you know, there's no dialogue in this text, and the interview was like, oh, yeah, you're right. And then I thought, well, yeah, I guess there is no dialogue because everybody <laughs> seemed to accept it. But I don't, I mean, I don't really know what the, how we formally define dialogue in a text. But I mean, there are th I mean the, the, the characters' speeches will have rhythms. There'll be things that may bring it closer to reported speech, uh, mm -hmm. to direct speech. But it's, mm -hmm. yeah, but it's, uh, tech, it's syntactically mm -hmm. reported, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even the look of the prose um, is sort of unusual for a novel. It's, there are long paragraphs. And the, the way they printed it, at least in this edition, mm -hmm the writing goes all the way to like half an inch below the border of the page. So it, it feels like this must be incredibly dense and this must be hard work reading it, but it's not, it flows. I was telling a friend today that this is not a novel to read on the Metro because you won't mm. be able to finish a sentence between the point where you get on it and the, where you get <laughs> off it and then you'll have to start all over again. I read it on the beach and I also felt a little bit odd because it was such a weirdly too pleasant environment yeah, it's for a common the heavy stuff that's in it. Common complaint on uh, <laughs> Goodreads is that um, this is not a beach read. Yes, yeah. exactly. They, yeah, they haven't invented that sticker yet. It doesn't work in marketing, but um, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a gap uh, in the market. Um, I would suggest that maybe you could read us the first paragraph. Yeah. Um, to give us a sense of the pace, the rhythm, and the language. Yeah. And then we'll take it from there. Okay. I'll, I mean, I'll also add that uh, it's funny that you pointed it out because it's actually one of my favorite parts of the book, the fact that there's no space, no white space in the, on, in the actual physical page, that it's almost always covered. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of liked it because... I kind of liked it, but well, I, I wanted the book to have uh, no entry except the beginning and no exit except the end. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be a text that uh, a person could enter uh, easily. Mm -hmm. So, for example, mm -hmm. to like, if you if you if you stop in the middle and you want to pick it up, uh, uh, maybe on your subway ride, mm -hmm. you'll probably have to read a few paragraphs or a few pages before the point where you stop to kind of. You know, it's difficult to mm -hmm. like enter where you left, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think that was something that I was trying to do, actually. Yeah, you successfully uh, did that. <laughs> yeah, but we can talk about that more. Um, so just the first <laughs> paragraph I'll read, you won't need any context. The present, we assume, is eternally before us, one of the few things in life from which we cannot be parted. It overwhelms us in the painful first moments of entry into the world when it is still too new to be managed or negotiated, 
remains by our side during childhood and adolescence, in those years before the weight of memory and expectation. And so it is sad and a little unsettling to see that we become, as we grow older, much less capable of touching, grazing, or even glimpsing it, that the closest we seem to get to the present are those brief moments we stop to consider the spaces our bodies are occupying, the intimate warmth of the sheets in which we wake, the scratched surface of the window on a train taking us somewhere else, as if the only way we can hold time still is by trying physically to prevent the objects around us from moving. The present, we realize, eludes us more and more as the years go by, showing itself for fleeting moments before losing us in the world's incessant movement, fleeing the second we look away and leaving scarcely a trace of its passing. Or this, at least, is how it usually seems in retrospect, when in the next brief moment of consciousness, the next occasion we are able to hold things still, we realize how much time has passed since we were last aware of ourselves, when we realize how many days, weeks, and months have slipped by without our consent. Events take place, moods ebb and flow, people and situations come and go, but looking back during these rare junctures in which we are, for whatever reason, lifted up from the circular daydream of everyday life, we are slightly surprised to find ourselves in the places we are, as though we were absent while everything was happening, as though we were somewhere else during the time that is usually referred to as our life. Waking up each morning, we follow by circuitous routes the thread of habit, out of our homes, into the world, and back to our beds at night, move unseeingly through familiar paths, one day giving way to another and one week to the next, so that when, in the midst of this daydream, something happens and the thread is finally cut, when, in a moment of strong desire or unexpected loss, the rhythms of life are interrupted, we look around and are quietly surprised to see that the world is vaster than we thought, as if we'd been tricked or cheated out of all that time, time that in retrospect appears to have contained nothing of substance, no change and no duration, time that has come and gone but left us somehow untouched. It's amazing. I mean, where do you find this in contemporary fiction? How, so we talked about how it's impossible to just pick up the book on your subway ride and jump right into where you left off. But how do you go about writing a book like that? Do you sit down and write the first paragraph like that? This first paragraph I wrote uh, not at the beginning of the, at the right, not at the beginning of the writing process. I wrote it somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how do I write passages like that? I mean, I'm writing another book now, and I and I'm trying to think how did I do it, and can I um, like you know like because I'm having a little difficulty now. I think uh, there are moments when a certain kind of mood overtakes you, um, when uh, you suddenly uh, feel, uh, and I use the word mood generally to describe this state, uh, a mood that brings together all the disparate elements, elements of the text that you, you want to include, um, a mood that can hold everything together, and then I when, I, when I find myself in such a mood that brings the text together, I, I, want, to, I want to write it down. I want to find some way to transcribe that mood uh, and I don't mean just the content, I mean also uh, the rhythm of that mood and the rhythm of the sentences that I'm writing. Um, and if I can hold that mood in my, in my head for long enough, then I can write such a passage, mm -hmm. uh, which I will then edit uh, in various ways. I mean, I edited this obviously a lot. Um, but if I, can, yeah, if I can find a piece of text to hold that mood together, mm -hmm. then, I can, uh, then, I can, then I find I can expand it uh, to be abstract or to be reflective mm -hmm. uh, in ways that, uh, in, in such a way that these, these sections come to seem representative of, of something in the text, mm -hmm. yeah. It does seem like sort of boiling down both stylistically and in terms of the philosophical views on time and uh, consciousness, what, what you set us into a mood as well as readers. So, yeah. Um, however, not all paragraphs read like this one, and you succeed in taking us into Krishan's sensual experiences as well. I, I thought that was actually really, really extraordinary, how you managed to make us experience 
his memories. It's not even what happens to his, him now, but he reflects on his own experiences from the past, for example, uh, encounters with Andrum, his lover. Um, I actually thought that um, your descriptions of the sex they had were among the most convincing I've ever read, um, which is something to say in a novel without any dialogue uh, by a writer who claims not to be interested in character. Um, maybe that's telling about me as well, but um, <laughs> the, the way they negotiate closeness and distance, there's something very, very serious about that, very powerful. And actually, I'm mad at you because I loved Anjum so much. Can you please write another novel about Anjum, with just about Anjum? And yeah. Yeah, um, I think a lot of people were um, <laughs> very. I mean, they, because the book has these three very interesting female characters, and it, mm. at its center is is kind of a passive and uninteresting young man, uh, in like biographically, but also in terms of how he. Uh, holds himself, I guess there's nothing there's mm. nothing as impressive. There's no conviction there, the conviction of uh of of these other women. Uh uh so I've uh, yeah so I've heard that I've heard <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before, but you know I, I wanted to write a narrator that was kind of similar to me, so I had to make him a little bit passive and boring. That's actually a question I was going to ask you. How much of yourself did you put in your character, in your Krishan protagonist? I don't actually believe he's all boring. Mm, um, yeah. I, I, I wish I met more m males in this world who are as self-reflected as he was, he is. Mm. Um, but yeah, what's the relationship between you and Krishan? Um, I think we are both similar uh, in terms of class status. Uh, we are both Tamil, we are both um, uh, 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 middle class or upper middle class, although really I'm from the Nouveau Riche. And um, I mean, that is a joke, <laughs> even though it's true. Um, <laughs> uh, he feels a lot of guilt, uh, the guilt of uh, the spectator, or of the individual who is um, doomed to spectatorship uh, when his community is being destroyed. Um, and that guilt of, because he's separated, uh, because he lives in the south, in the capital, because he's separated from the war zone, um, uh, the guilt he feels watching uh, his community being destroyed during the last years of the war, during uh, what we later came to recognize as a genocide, uh, is also something that I um, have felt strongly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah, I mean, I mean, those are all strong points of those are all strong points of contact. But obviously, his life mm -hmm. is 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 different from mine. Mm. Yeah. Um, would you like to read us that other passage that we talked about uh -huh. earlier? I think that yeah, fits this nicely here. Yeah, it's kind of about um, Krishan's relation to to relationship to guilt, specifically his relationship to these uh, these acts of genocide that took place at the end of the war, and that he found out about only uh, after everything was uh, over. Perhaps because he. Perhaps because he'd grasped the enormity of what had happened only after everything was already over, when there was no longer anything that could be done. Perhaps because he'd had no Tamil friends in Delhi with, which, with whom he could talk or process his feelings. His own response to the end of the war had taken a more inward direction. Thinking of that period now, he was slightly taken aback by the quiet intensity of his reaction, by the unhealthy fervor with which he immersed, in, immersed himself in all the images and videos he found the diligence with which he tried to reconstruct that situation from which he'd been spared. He'd begun making mental timelines of the displacement of civilians from their villages across the Northeast, of the locations of the various hospitals that had come under attack by the government, of the sites of the no-fire zones at which the worst massacres had occurred, studying all the maps of the war zone he could find and learning everything he could about these different places. He did his best to obtain every little piece of information he could, noting the different kinds of shell the army had used and the different kinds of sound they made as they fell, the weather conditions and soil comp composition at all the different sites of killing, guessing or inventing all the details he couldn't verify, recreating those sites of violence in his mind so meticulously that his intention could only have been to personally inhabit them somehow. 
There was an element of self-hatred in these labors, he knew, a desire to punish himself for what he'd escaped by exposing himself to it as violently as he could. But it struck him now that perhaps there was also something religious in his devotion to understanding the circumstances under which so many people had been erased from the world, as though he was trying to construct, through this act of imagination, a kind of private shrine to the memory of all those anonymous lives. Looking out to the window at the empty, endless sky, Oh, I see. Okay, I've actually uh, started reading where I was told I should. I, uh, where I, should, I was told I should stop reading. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't even realize. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to go back because um, <laughs> I think I think I think it's worth it. Um, for a long time, the horror these images elicited remained buried inside him, a morbid reality that he was constantly feeding and yet unable to express, as though unable to fully believe or understand what they depicted. It was only when the Channel 4 documentary came out in 2011, accusing the government of war crimes and genocide, when later that year the UN published its report giving an estimate of how many civilians had died, that he was finally able to speak about what had happened, to accept that the images he'd become obsessed with were not some strange, perverted creation of his subconscious life, that they represented things that had really happened in the country he was from. Even now he felt ashamed thinking about his initial reluctance to acknowledge the magnitude of what had happened at the end of the war as though he'd been hesitant to believe the evidence of his computer screen because his own poor, violated, stateless people were the ones alleging it, as though he'd been unable to take the suffering of his own people seriously till it was validated by the authority of a panel of foreign experts, legitimized by a documentary narrated by a clean-shaven white man standing in front of a camera in suit and tie. Like most Tamils his age living outside the war zone, whether Colombo or Chennai or Paris or Toronto, He'd watched the documentary and read the report several times, had continued trying to find out everything he could afterward, reading every article and essay that came out in both English and Tamil, watching all the interviews he could find with survivors on YouTube. His initial disbelief gave way first to shock, then to anger, and then to shame at his own easy existence. This shame giving rise over the months that followed to an uncanny sense of unreality, as though the world he was inhabiting in Delhi was somehow illusory, his courses at university and future academic plans, the protests and demonstrations he went to almost as a pastime, the various friends, lovers, and crushes who made up his social life. Nothing around him seemed to register the extent of what had happened. Even on the final day of the war, life in college went on more or less as usual, everyone immersed in studying for their end-of-term exams. And this incongruity between his environment and what was going on inside him, his growing sense that the world as he understood it had come to an end, led him to feel that the spaces he inhabited lacked some vital dimension of reality, that his life in Delhi was some kind of dream or hallucination. It was probably some dissonance of this kind, it occurred to him now, that had led so many Tamils living in foreign countries to such acts of desperation that led that boy whose name he could no longer remember to travel from London to Geneva so he could set himself on fire in front of the UN building in February 2009, that led tens of thousands of protesters, most of them refugees, to spontaneously gather three months later on one of Toronto's major highways and bring the entire city's traffic to a standstill, as if these exiled Tamils were willing to go to any length to force the alien environments in which they now lived, so far from the northeast of Sri Lanka, to come at least briefly to a stop, to reflect or register in some way the cessation of life that they knew was occurring in their place of birth. Mm. Mm. So if we, um, if, if I previously claimed that your novel read like a modernist novel, I'll take it back. It's a postmodernist novel. You can pick it up, shuffle the paragraphs around, just read whichever. No. I'm joking, but no, no it's it true because actually, I mean, because this text is so um, not plot driven, mm -hmm. uh, there are all of these passages about his thoughts and his reflections and his memories, which really, as I was writing, I'm like, I can put these anywhere in the text. There's really no, um, the narrative logic does not um, necessitate that these materials are placed in one part r rather than at the other. I mean, I'm sure those two paragraphs that I read in the wrong direction, I have placed in the direction that I actually read to you at various points. There's a lot of, um, I guess, uh, arranging and, and rearranging. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the kind of, the external world is in this text, it's kind of like a, it's like an anchor. Mm -hmm. it's, like a, mm -hmm. it's like a boat that you enter the water into, you know, that you can anchor and dive, enter into the water from. It's, mm -hmm. um, 
it's really just there so that you can enter the character's mind. Mm -hmm. And once mm -hmm. you're in the character's mind, really there's no reason for it to go in one direction rather than another. Yeah. And at the same time, the novel has a very specific structure. Um, you said there are no white spaces, but there are chapters and there are mm -hmm. three parts. Mm -hmm. um, so the first part is called Message. So now I'm going to just tell you a little bit of about the plot, which apparently doesn't exist here, but there is a plot. So there's a message. Um, there are two messages. One is the message that Rani, Krishan's grandmother's caretaker, passed away, as we heard. And the other message is a message from Krishan's lover of the past, Anjum, whom I love now. Um, so he kind of switches back and forth between Rani and Anjum, and he uh, thinks about both these women. Um, and then we come to part two, which is his journey to the north, to Rani's funeral. Um, do you want to tell us, sort of on the level of plot, if you mind, um, why does he decide to go to Rani's funeral? Well, I think as, as out of a sense of obligation, I think out of a feeling of guilt and... Um, he can't help but feel, I guess, that he and his grandmother may have in some way caused uh, her death because she was working with them for two years or working in, in, uh, in, in their house, living with Amama. Uh, and um, she disappears one day without notice and they cannot get in touch with her. They cannot get in touch with her for months. And then the next they hear from her is actually from her daughter when she informs them that, uh, that her mother has passed away. So Krishan can't help wonder, I guess it's part of his guilt complex, whether his own, uh, his own actions or his own presence in Rani's life somehow pushed her toward, uh, toward, that, toward that particular end, whether, whether being around someone who was so fortunate or so lucky or so, un so unscarred, these are the kinds of, I guess, mm -hmm fears or anxieties, or maybe that his grandmother mistreated Rani, maybe she was rude, or maybe in a kind of, in her senile state, she was, um, she hurt Rani. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess he kind of wants to go there and wants to find out because he fears um, he is responsible. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, that really is just a projection, I think, of his, of his general feeling that uh, it was something he did that, that led to the destruction of his, of his community. Mm -hmm. Actually, every time you mention the word community, I'm reminded of the scene. Um, he arrives in Rani's village and in her house, and he witnesses the morning rituals that the villagers have arranged for Rani, and he's sort of um, uncomfortable. He feels that he doesn't belong. He's a sort of middle-class city person, and he doesn't understand all the intricate rituals that much feels like an intruder a little bit. So that's where I wondered, um, community, what does it really mean in this context? I don't know if you want to talk about this. Um, what are the divisions within Tamil in, Within society? Tamil society? Well, uh, Tamil society is very divided, um, first and foremost by caste, which is also how uh, uh, other Hindu communities in the subcontinent are divided. Um, in this particular context, there is also the division between the rural and the urban. And uh, Krishan has this almost uh, uh, kind of uh, ethnographic interest in these people that he comes from, but has now been divorced from uh, by virtue of the fact that he grew up in a city. Um, and that he is bilingual and that he speaks English and that he has connection to the world outside Sri Lanka through uh, the English language and his education. Um, but there's also kind of uh, another important communal division that this book gestures at, which is that um, in our community, we have maybe three to three to 3 3.5 uh, million people, of which maybe uh, close to half, a million and a half uh, people um, are diasporic, live outside the country. And we generally, I guess in Sri Lanka, we tend to think of diaspora as people who have left the place where they are from. Um, 
the I think the biggest division in our society, in our community since the end of the war is not about uh, necessarily uh, who is in Sri Lanka and who is outside Sri Lanka, but really about who was there at the end of the war to witness the destruction uh, of our community. There has become, in a way, like how I understand diaspora now in, in the context of uh, Sri Lankan Tamil society, is that you are diaspora not if you were not born on this land, but you are diaspora if you do not witness uh, this time, if you were not there. In this sense, Krishan, though he's from the island of Sri Lanka, though he spent most of his life living there, is diasporic, because there's an experience to which he is foreign. Um, and really that, that experience was so devastating, so overwhelming, and so definitive of how uh, the genocide, I mean, so definitive of how we came to understand ourselves uh, in the aftermath of that time that, um, yeah, really, I would say the fundamental kind of division, uh, one of the fundamental divisions in our society is uh, who was there mm -hmm. and who, who, was, who was forced to witness. This book, is about, this book is about witness. It's about spectatorship because Krishan is somebody who was not there and who only has access to what happened there through photos, through footage taken by survivors that made its way onto the internet and that filtered uh, through various, through various uh, means uh, into social media, into uh, news websites that he, uh, that he, that he would look at. Um, he is therefore uh, burdened with this him and the other uh, and all the other members of our community who are not there in this particular place and in this particular time are forced, are compelled, are compelled to imagine, therefore, or to reconstruct what happened. Mm -hmm. And this is a kind of, um, and they also face this kind of, uh, I guess, vivid kind of cognitive disjunction, the disjunction of feeling in your mind that the world has been destroyed. And then this comes up in, this, in the passage that I read with Krishan in Delhi during university. And, and seeing in the world around you no sign whatsoever that anything has happened. Mm -hmm. There's a feeling of, you know, as if, uh, as if, um, yeah, as if the world has been destroyed but nobody around you understands it or, and, can, no, and you cannot communicate it with them. And this kind of psychological disjunction is, I think, central to this, uh, to this distinction between who is there and who is not. Mm -hmm. I mean, Krishan is incredibly hard on himself too. Uh, he lost his father um, as a result of the civil war. Um, he does engage in many ways um, to support his community. And he still has this longing to feel more part of it than he will ever be able to. And there's always going to be this gap sort of to belong to a community of trauma where really you should feel that you don't want to belong to it because it's too much. And he's already burdened so much. But maybe we could go from here to the reading in German um, because, um, unless you want to add something no, to this. No, I think, I think it's a good time um, to do. Yeah, because this is actually a passage from uh, the funeral um, procession. So um, Krishan decided to accompany the coffin to the place where the pyre is, where the coffin with the body is going to be burned. Um, it's only the men from the village that go on this procession, the women stay behind. So just for context, this is where we are. Unter der Last der Leiche ging es ebenso langsam weiter, während die weite, sanft geschwungene Landschaft allmählich grüner wurde und in undiszipliniertem Eifer Gräser, Pflanzen und Sträucher neben Baumgruppen aus dem Boden schossen, deren Äste Blätter schwer niederhingen. Bis auf einen Radfahrer, der ihnen entgegenkam, behutsam anhielt und am Wegesrand wartete, gab es keine Spur menschlichen Lebens, während sie weiterzogen. Kaum etwas regte sich um sie herum bis auf die schwerelosen weißen Schmetterlinge, die wie in Zeitlupe durch die Vegetation huschten. 
Krishan war von Colombo aus sieben Stunden Zug gefahren. Von Kilinochi aus noch drei Stunden mit zwei verschiedenen Bussen und als er bei Rani zu Hause angekommen war, war es ihm vorgekommen, als wäre er so tief in den Nordosten vorgedrungen, wie es nur ging. Aber als er nun das Dorf durchquert hatte und in dieses unerwartete Land gekommen war, entlang dieses unbefestigten Weges fernab der Landstraße ging, war ihm, als würde er eine weit abgelegene Sphäre betreten, die auf keiner Karte zu finden und von der niedergeschriebenen Geschichte unberührt ge geblieben war. Einen Ort, der ihm zugleich seltsam vertraut erschien, als wäre er dort schon einmal im Traum oder in einem früheren Leben gewandelt. Er befand sich immer noch am Ende des Trauerzuges. Die Männer vor ihm, vielleicht 20 oder 30 insgesamt, gingen langsam und geduldig weiter, den Blick auf den Boden vor sich oder auf den weiteren Weg gerichtet. Die Trommler führten ihren Rhythmus leise hinter der Leiche fort, was die Stille um sie herum nur betonte. In dem kleinen, abgeschlossenen Raum von Ranis Haus und innerhalb der säuberlichen Umfriedung des Gartens hatten ihn all die Gefühle überwältigt, das Getöse des Wehklagens und Trommelns, der Anblick der Leiche und das Gedränge darum herum. Aber wie sie nun durchs offene Gelände zogen und sich der Spätnachmittagshimmel vor ihnen erstreckte, schienen diese Gefühle klein, geradezu belanglos, so als kehrte er hier draußen im Angesicht des Kontrasts zur Weite der Welt, vor der sie alle zu nichts dahin schrumpften, so dass ihm das Gemeinschaftsgefühl genommen war, das ihn bei der Totenfeier mit allen verbunden hatte, wieder zu seinen eigenen Gedanken zurück und erinnerte sich wieder an seine Identität. Weiter vorne schien das Land allmählich flacher zu werden und links vom Weg zeigte sich eine weitläufige, schimmernde Fläche, die das Blassgold des Himmels spiegelte. Die Schmetterlinge wurden seltener und an ihre Stelle traten die hastigeren, unsteteren Bewegungen der Libellen. Und als sie sich der glitzernden Fläche näherten, entpuppte sich diese als ein riesiger See mit Fahnen und hohem Gras am Rand, während das andere Ufer in der Ferne nicht zu sehen war, wo das Wasser still mit Hügeln oder Wolken am Horizont verfloss. Es war schwer zu sagen, ob es sich um einen natürlichen See handelte oder ob es einer der von Jahrhunderten von alten Königen und Stammesfürsten angelegten Teiche war, die wegen ihres Alters nun zentrale Bestandteile des Ökosystems waren. Aber während er den See im Gehen betrachtete, dessen ruhiges und wellenloses Wasser sich sanft und friedlich ans Ufer schmiegte, wurde in Krishan das Gefühl stärker, er sei schon einmal hier gewesen, schon einmal diesen Weg gegangen und habe dort am Ufer dieses Sees gesessen. Es konnte im Nordosten nicht viele Seen von dieser Größe geben, das wusste er, und er holte sein Handy heraus, um zu schauen, ob er ihn bei Google Maps finden konnte, was aber nicht klappte, weil er keinen Empfang hatte. Er fragte sich, ob er vielleicht einmal daran vorbeigekommen war, als er von seiner Arbeit in Jaffna aus, der, de, aus dem District besucht hatte, aber er wusste ganz sicher, dass er noch nie in Ranis Dorf gewesen war und konnte sich auch nicht daran erinnern, dass er sich jemals länger in dieser Gegend aufgehalten hätte. Er hätte einen der Männer im Trauerzug nach dem Namen des Sees fragen können, aber keiner von ihnen schien darauf zu achten und außerdem wäre es wohl nicht der richtige Zeitpunkt für so eine Frage gewesen, zumal alle anderen so verloren in ihren eigenen Gedanken schienen. Sein Blick kehrte zwanghaft immer wieder zum See zurück, wie zu einem Gesicht, das er irgendwo schon mal gesehen hatte, aber nicht einordnen konnte. Und erst als er an einer flachen Stelle das Schilf aufragen sah, machte es Klick. Und alles wurde klar. Denn etwas ungläubig verstand er, dass ihm der See nicht aus einem eigenen Erlebnis bekannt vorkam, sondern weil er ihn im Internet gesehen hatte, in einer Szene, einer Doku, die er einige Jahre zuvor in Delhi geschaut hatte. Er hatte sich den Film hinterher noch zwei- oder dreimal angesehen und war monatelang besessen davon gewesen, nachdem er ihn nicht lang nach seiner Faszination für Kutimani zufällig auf YouTube gefunden hatte, in der Zeit, als seine Aufmerksamkeit von den Traumata des Kriegsendes zu den Sehnsüchten, bei dessen Anfang gewechselt hatte. Der Film, an dessen Namen er sich nicht erinnerte, war kaum über eine Stunde lang und 
obwohl er von einer Filmemacherin aus Dänemark oder Norwegen oder einem dieser anderen nordeuropäischen Länder handelte, die so schwer auseinanderzuhalten waren, war er frei von der Gönnerhaftigkeit, von der so viele britische und europäische Dokumentarfilme über Gewalt und Leid in den ehemaligen Kolonien strotzten, frei von der rechtschaffenen Besserwisserei, die in dem Genre vorherrschte. Der Film drehte sich um das Leben einer 24-jährigen Frau namens Darashika, Darashika, die er noch lebhaft vor Augen hatte. Eine Frau, die zu dem Zeitpunkt aktive Kämpferin der Black Tigers war. Die Black Tigers waren die gefürchtete Elitetruppe der Tigers, die auf sorgfältig geplante und präzise ausgeführte Selbstmordkommandos spezialisiert waren. Von Attentaten auf Politiker über Bombenanschläge im öffentlichen Raum bis hin zu kleinen, aber verheerenden Angriffen auf die Stützpunkte der Armee und Marine Sri Lankas. Und wenn man Dashika im Laufe des Dokumentarfilms sprechen hörte, merkte man, dass auch sie zur Elite gehörte. Es war, als wäre sie geradezu von den Göttern für ihre Rolle erwählt, nicht nur wegen ihrer strengen Schönheit, ihrer scharf umrissenen, stolzen Züge und der dunkel schimmernden Haut, sondern auch wegen ihres stählern durchdringenden Blickes und der Gewissheit ihrer Haltung, der Überzeugung, mit der sie über die Brutalität der Regierung Sri Lankas sprach und wegen ihrer Be Bereitschaft zu kämpfen und zu sterben, um ihr Volk zu beschützen. Es hatte tausende Frauen wie sie gegeben, aber während man ihr zuhörte, machte man sich unweigerlich Gedanken, wie so ein Mensch möglich war, wie sie so geworden war, welche Erfahrungen und Neigungen sie auf diesen Weg geführt hatten, der so anders war als jene, die andere Frauen und Männer in ihrem Alter einschlugen. Ein Weg, der eindeutig zum Tod führte, zur vollkommenen Auslöschung des Bewusstseins, den sie aber dennoch mit völliger Leichtigkeit und Selbstsicherheit ging. Als könnte sie das Ende kaum erwarten. Vielen Dank, Marie. Okay, I'm torn. Should we take some questions from the audience? Yeah. yeah? And then I have another one. Gibt es denn Fragen aus dem Publikum? Ah, okay, super. Wir haben hier ein Mikrofon. Um, ich sehe hier dritte Reihe, ganz links meldet sich schon eine Person. Um, genau, und Fragen können auf Englisch oder auf Deutsch gestellt werden. Ich kann es auch uh, verdolmetschen, wenn es auf Deutsch eine Frage gibt. Technik, ich glaube, wir brauchen Hilfe. Yeah. Hello, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm from India. Um, I have just one question. How do you introspect? Can you explain your process of introspection? Um, that's a really good question. Um, how do I introspect? Um, well, I try to make, uh, I, have a, I have a journal in which I note down things. Generally the things that uh, happen to me or that I witness, uh, they could be, um, uh, they could be um, things that I've seen on TV, things that I've read. Um, I make these, I, I write these observations down um, and I come back to them. I reread what I've written And I find that over time, uh, an anecdote or an observation or a story, um, things begin uh, to, to uh, I begin to add things to, to this, uh, to, the, to the initial observation or thought. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, um, I'm trying to think of an example, but um, let's say for example, Uh, one thing I've noticed, uh, or that I noticed at a certain point, is that, um, and it might have been from something that I was reading, uh, that uh, oftentimes, say, when people are in conflict, people who are close to each other, say family members, uh, when they're in conflict, uh, it happens often in Tamil families, there's a logic of escalation. One person says something to wound the other, the other person um, is wounded, does not Is not, does not feel vulnerable enough to be able to say, you've wounded me, look what you've done. 
uh, and so instead wounds the other uh, even more. Uh, and this escalation continues until each person is saying absurd and untrue things about the other person with the sole intent of hurting them. Now, I've seen this because it happens often in my, fam in my family. And um, I also notice that there is, at certain points, uh, a moment in which when two people are throwing absurd claims uh, in rage at each other, uh, where somebody says something so absurd that there is a moment of, um, in which both people stop uh, and look at each other. And if one person smiles just a little bit, um, gives just the, the hint of a grin, it is like an offer to the other person in the interaction. They can take the smile and begin to laugh and turn, the, turn this cycle, this escalating logic uh, into something uh, non-destructive, or they can, um, they can continue with the, with the logic that assures mutual self-destruction. Um, for example, this is something that has happened in my family. I've noted it down. And uh, every time since it's happened, I every time there's another iteration of this kind of conflict with a friend uh, uh, or somebody I'm in a relationship with or my family members, uh, I'll notice another element of it. Uh, I'll notice, um, I'll notice uh, another detail. I'll notice another way in which rage is, is used. I'll, I'll notice another way in which humor might be. Uh, and so these things accumulate over time. And so really the only uh, practical skill I think involved is um, uh, the ability to write down and return in my writing to what I've already written down. It's really a very kind of uh, mechanical kind of thing. If you follow this kind of, uh, this kind of, I don't know, it's, it's really about valuing my thoughts, I think, because I notice there are periods in which I don't value my thoughts, in which I don't write them down. And when I don't write them down, there's nothing from which uh, to start, or there's nothing to elaborate upon or build upon. Uh, so if I, if I tell myself the things that I'm thinking are significant, then sooner or later they will lead to something significant. Thank you. That's interesting. Okay, we have another question in the second row again with... Uh, yeah? I speak zwar English, but I say it in Deutsch. I found it was zum Teil zu schnell gesprochen. Also I could jetzt den text als sie es gelesen hat, Uh, fand ich es richtig gut, aber als ja. er so schnell gelesen hat, uh, 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 habe ich viel, vieles nicht so richtig verstanden. Danke für das Feedback. Also um, meine Frage ist, also ich war auch schon in Sri Lanka, mhm. um, uh, er, er, er sprach davon, dass er in den USA studiert hat und dass er in Delhi war, also mhm. ab welcher Zeit ist er dann weggegangen? Und wann kam er wieder? Mm -hmm. Also wie viele Jahre hat er mm -hmm. in der Diaspora verbracht? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, danke schön. Uh, I didn't, I, I'll just speak in mm -hmm. Deutsch. I didn't, I wasn't able to follow your reading entirely because it was slightly too fast for me, but um, what I would like to hear more about is your biography. Um, when did you leave Sri Lanka? Where did you spend time? When and how? Where, where were you all these years? Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, I grew up in Sri Lanka. I was born there and I lived there till I was 18 and I've been uh, moving around since then. I've spent a number of years in the United States where I was doing a PhD. I spent a number of years, maybe three years living in, in India for a year in South India and for a couple of years in New Delhi. Uh, I've been in Europe for the last year or two. Um, but, you know, I spend a lot of uh, my waking hours uh, at home, indoors, uh, and sometimes the scenery outside changes, but also I'm, I'm talking to the same people, I am reading the same things, I'm continuing to write uh, or work on the same writing projects. Uh, so in a way, it doesn't also feel that I've moved places that much or that I've ever really... Uh, left home, and when I returned to Sri Lanka at the end of my time in Germany, or to India as the case may be, um, it won't really feel like I've, like I've left home, that I'm returning home either. Can I uh, come with another follow-up question to that? Yeah. When you were not in Sri Lanka, did you engage with the Sri Lankan diaspora? Well, it's a, well, I was living in America, and there's not much Sri Lankan Tamil diaspora, because America doesn't accept refugees, really. Mm. So the 
generally the, <laughs> the I don't know. I mean, America generally accepts only like uh, uh, educated professional people as immigrants, and so really the only Sri Lankans there are the are the children of such immigrants, and they tend to be uh, kind of uninteresting and not really interested in the historical experience of of our people. Um, I have I do have relatives. I would say most of my family lives between. Uh, I have family in London, in Toronto, um, in South India, and in Australia, and also here in Germany. I have uh, one of my uncles moved here as a refugee in 1981. Um, so I'm really all my family uh, are members of the diaspora. So I've been in touch with them for a long for a long time. You know, I visited, they visited, and so, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of friends from the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I hope that. Uh, helps. More questions? Okay, then I'll have one. Um, in the passage that Marie read to us, um, you mention a documentary film, um, and you describe it so vividly, it almost feels like if you could quote a film, an entirely, uh, well, uh, an entire documentary film, which includes long shots of scenery, then you did it. But you also introduce other intertexts into your novel. Um, various things from the Tamil, Sanskrit, and Buddhist traditions, classics. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what these texts mean to you. Hmm. Well, yeah, the text involves, I mean, this, te this novel incorporates a number of, yeah, um, external materials, I'll call them, uh, the majority of which are all texts from different South Asian literary canons, from the Tamil, from the Sanskrit, and from the Pali. Um, and I, I guess, you know, it, it was a long time since, I've started, uh, since I started writing this book. I must have started writing this book in 2015. And I think at that time, I felt a lot more, I felt I felt qualms, which I still have, around my use of the English language, um, which sometimes strikes me as uh, a shameful matter because I come from a, a linguistic tradition that is much richer and much older than, than the one available in English. Um, and so why do, I, why do I choose to write um, in, this much, in this much newer uh, and much, I don't know, um, whatever, it doesn't resonate as much uh, with me in, in, in certain ways. Uh, I do it because uh, that was how I was educated and that was how, uh, uh, that because, and I was educated in this way because English was the language in which prestige was to be found uh, and, and upwards mobility. And that strikes me as a matter of uh, something to be ashamed about a little bit. Um, so at that time, the fact that I wrote in English was something that I needed to deal with in some way. And the fact that I am writing in a language whose uh, historical canon is located in in a place that's totally totally foreign from 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 where I was born, um, and I think one way I tried to do that, which came up, which 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 I which I kind of um, executed in this text, was to take to take texts from. N from different Indian, different South Asian uh, literary, uh, literary traditions and to incorporate them into this text and to, in addition to, I guess, just um, telling the story in the way that it uh, struck me, uh, also um, reflecting on those, on those narratives in various ways and trying to find points of continuity between a story about the life of the Buddha or the story about a Tamil saint uh, or the story about uh, women who joined the Buddhist order uh, 2,000 years ago in central India, um, to take these historical texts, these, what are often extremely, extremely beautiful, I mean, these are also really beautiful and rich and poetic texts, um, to bring them here into this one, uh, and then to elaborate on them and find points of contact, as if this text that I am writing now in English could in some way uh, be connected to these other canons, which is not, uh, which is not something, it, it's not an experiment that I feel I, I, I mean, it's not, it's not something that can be done, I feel now, or it's not some, it, it was a slightly misleading and dishonest uh, attempt to connect myself to a tradition, I think. Uh, and part of the problem was also, 
the history of reading in South Asia is extremely um, it's extremely messed up. It's a, well, you know, it's 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 caste based for for millennia, for centuries. Who has access to texts? Who has access to writing? Has been decided by the caste system. Generally, only the very um, uh, top most castes have access. People are from low caste are beaten, punished, killed often for um, attempting to write or attempting to read or learning or attempting to learn how to read. Um, and I realize, uh, you know, in, in a way, say for example, the Sanskrit tra tra canon in, in India, in a way my animosity towards that canon is far greater than my animosity towards the English canon or the German canon or, you know, like uh, in the sense that um, these canons, I mean, they're just as messed up. They're just as, uh, they, they, they involve just as much violence. And the violence is much more intimate because it's violence that I see also in the society that I, that I grew up in. So in a way, I can't accept now, uh, uh, I cannot seek a point of contact between me and these particular texts, these, especially, especially the Sanskrit tradition. I feel differently about the Tamil tradition. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's not something that, yeah, so in that sense, it's not something that I would, I would do again. Mm. Yeah. You know, I would never have thought this. When I read the book, I thought they fit very smoothly, mm. the way that Krishan reflects on these texts and they sort of flow in and out of his consciousness. I, it, what you say makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, um, you know, good writing can, can conceal dishonest gestures sometimes. <laughs> it, you, you did it very well. <laughs> I'm, I'm very... Um, yeah, um, curious to see what you will do next. Um, but yeah, um, we are running out of time. Do you have any more questions? No, okay. In that case, I think we'll wrap it up. Or should I? Well, there's like one more thing. Okay, <laughs> we can do one more thing. There's one more thing. I, I could ask you backstage later, but I think I'll do it now. Um, so I spent some time in New Delhi. My family lived there for a while, and I visited. And I thought, OK, there is, there is a scene here, but I find no access to it, a queer scene, a sort of intellectual scene, artistic scene. I, I just couldn't, I wasn't there long enough to enter it. And now, reading your book, I felt like, oh my god, this is my first encounter with what I was looking for in Delhi. Um, and I was amazed to see how you weave this in and out of your main character's um, consciousness as well. Is there anything you would like to say about your experience with um, different subcultures in South Asia now, or the situation in South Asia, in Sri Lanka, and in India now at all? in any context? Hmm. No, I can't, but I can't, I mean, I can say that I, I, I also felt this, uh, this, this desire to find, um, to find a place in South Asia where there were, <laughs> Sri Lanka is not an interesting place to me because it's so small. India has always seemed, uh, Sri Lanka is so small that, uh, uh, and, and people are so inward looking that there is very little sense that they will, we will construct our own future. Um, in India, I mean, India is vast and has so many different languages and cultures, not to mention subcultures, but um, it's a large place, uh, large enough for people to feel that they are at the center of the world and that the experiments of, uh, experiments for living that, uh, and the forms of life that they come up with will be forms that they have found, that they have experimented with. It, feel, it felt to me uh, when I was younger that um, uh, certain places in India, uh, a project was being, uh, there was a project of, of, I mean, we're talking about a place that for the last several hundred years has been deprived of the chance to uh, construct its future. And I felt that there were certain interesting experiments in different places there. Uh, with respect to how should we be, how should we create the future, a project that did not look outside, mm -hmm. that did not necessarily look to other countries or other communities. And I found that because of the cultural continuities, I found that very exciting. Um, obviously, India does not seem to have uh, to be taking the right, uh, the right direction <laughs> in terms of the future. 
uh, but but such people and such communities still exist, and I found them very exciting, and I think that was what pushed me there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wanted to kind of include it in the book. A little yeah, thank bit. you for doing that. It, it re rekindled my interest in India in unexpected ways. <laughs> All right, I think we'll come to an end now. So let me thank our guests. First of all, Asta, <laughs> Anuk, Arut Pragasam. And let me thank Marie Laka for reading and for being so flexible with what you read. <laughs> and thank you, dear audience. I hope to see you again. Have a lovely evening. Thank you.